the commissioner's box, located between home plate and the Oyo's dugout, for tonight's ceremonial first pitch. The former minor league pitcher is making his first World Series start. The governor of the state of Maryland, the Honorable Harry Hughes. Governor Hughes pitched for the Philadelphia A's Farm Club in Federalsburg, Maryland, Eastern Shore League, back in 1949. If you saw that throw out to Doug DeCense, you could see it was off the mark. Well, Governor Hughes was 0-4 with a 554 ERA in 16 games. <laughs> <laughs> now you know why he's in politics. <laughs> Here's the lineup for the Pirates. As you heard, Rex Barney, the old fireballer, still looks great. Give it to you when he introduced the players, and I still think the man at the very top of that batting order is bound to be a very important figure as this series wears on between two evenly balanced teams. We're waiting now for the defensive unit for Baltimore to come out on the field. Howard detailed the weather for you as we came on the air. We had a little bit more of the wind earlier this afternoon and uh, then early this evening. But now the wind is quiet and the flag hangs limp and the Baltimore Orioles will wait until their starting pitcher Jim Palmer has concluded his warm-up procedures and he is quite deliberate about it goes about it in the same way most every time and I suspect Don Drysdale that's a very important thing to do well you kind of get into a habit Keith and Jim Palmer when he will come in he will make his way in from the bullpen he will just drop the cap or bat off I should say the jacket off and he'll just make his way to the mound but right now he just wants to make sure that he is keyed up and ready to go the strike zone will be a conversation piece for a while tonight Earlier, Howard talked with Jim about it. The National League umpire, Engel, will be behind the plate tonight, Jim. You're a high fastball pitcher. They don't give you the high strike in the National League. How will you be affected? Well, I hope I won't be affected at all, Howard. I can throw the ball down when I want to or if I'm in a good groove. But Bert and I are similar type pitchers where we both primarily throw a lot of fastballs, especially up in the strike zone. He has a better curveball. I have a slider. We both have change-ups. I think mine's a little bit better. But, um, you know, it's something I, I think that I'll be helped by the fact that the Pirates are supposed to be high-ball fastball hitters and they are aggressive hitters. But the big thing, I think, and, and what makes me successful is going out there and getting the first pitch over. I'm going to have to get in a groove. The last four innings of the playoffs, I was in a great groove. I got the ball down. I'm going to have to do that early or I'm going to be in trouble because, like you said, they don't give you any high pitches. And if I get behind and the Pirates lay off, it's going to be a long night. Well, I think really that kind of told the whole story in a nutshell right there, Keith. Jim realizes that he is going to have to get the ball down, and there are your umpires, Bob Engel from the National League behind home plate. The American League umpire, Russ, gets it first from the National League. Terry Tannett, second base. Jim McKeon over at third from the American League. It'll be Paul Rungi of the National League down the left field line, and Jerry Newdecker, who was behind the plate last night, he'll be down the right field line. As you watch Palmer, he will walk down. Most of the pitchers, they will come down in that cart. Jim has his own theories, his own set ways, and he's done it so many times successfully here, Howard, at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. He has been, of course, one of the greatest money pitchers of his time, and for that matter, maybe of all time, as you look at the dimensions of Memorial Stadium. 225 career victories and clearly destined for the Hall of Fame, Keith. No question. Witty man, very entertaining fellow, and we had him with us a year ago uh, working in the American League Championship Series. And now the Baltimore Orioles take the field. And as they run into the outfield, you will see down in the left field area, it looks like it's dirt, and that's exactly what it is. It's dirt tonight. Last night, it was mud. Out in right field, you also have a bit of the same problem, but the sun was in and out through the day. There was some wind, and it aided greatly in firming up the turf and making the conditions tonight quite acceptable. In left field for Baltimore, John Lowenstein playing with a very sore ankle, but he's in there. He's an important fellow, especially from the offensive point of view in center field. You have the speedster for Baltimore, that is Al Bumbry. He was kind of quiet last night himself. He didn't cause a whole lot of things to happen, but he can, and he's the top of the order. 
Over in right field, you have the big guy, Ken Singleton. And Singleton figured in that first inning explosion in that he was an out. And that was surprising because the way the ball was flying around. But from that point on, Kenny got in his licks. Moving to the inner defense, Doug DeSensei, whose two-run homer decided the game, but then lost the ball in the lights and committed two errors. And you won't see DeSensei boot it very many times, twice in the game at shortstop. Mark Belanger, he's a bit beat up after that collision with Dave Parker at second base. His hand is sore, his leg is sore, but apparently not sore enough to keep him on the bench. At second base, you have switch hitting Billy Smith, and that's an important thing to note because that's why he's in there. He can go from the other side of the plate against the right-hander, Bly Levin. Over at first base, Eddie Murray. And I wonder how many fastballs Bly Levin, the Dutchman, will throw to Murray tonight. Working back at the plate, he had an outstanding ball game last night. I thought Rick Dempsey catching and out on the mound. The details on this man, well established now. Jim Palmer, health problems early this year, hurt his back, couldn't arch it. He went to a three-quarter arm delivery, went off to consult the orthopedist about it. Had tendonitis in his elbow. Dr. Robert Curlin said, have you been bringing your arm down because of your bad back? Dr. Palmer said, yep. Dr. Curlin said, that's why your elbow's hurt. He missed about 15 starts. So you get a little bit out of the groove, the one that you've been developing for 10 or 15 years, and all of a sudden you're going to hurt yourself. And here's a man waiting in the on-deck circle, Omar Moreno, who has run off 18 consecutive stolen bases. He has plenty of blazing speed. To once again detail the circumstance of Moreno, and I thought his role in the game last night was quite important. With runners in scoring position in the fifth inning, he struck out with a base runner on second base. In the sixth inning, he flied out with the bases loaded for the third out. And in the eighth inning, he struck out with runners on first and third. Well, Keith, you were talking about Dave Parker tying the record for the most hits in the first game. Actually, Moreno has the distinction, and it's kind of dubious at that, the most at bats in a game for nine innings with no hits. He was 0 for 5 last night. Of course, that is held by many players. There's a lot of 0 for going along in that, in that particular group. Palmer, meticulous as always, talking to Bob Engel, the plate umpire, and now Jim's about ready to go. And Marino has come walking out, standing just outside the batter's box. You know, I really think, in all fairness to the umpires, I think they all realize when they get in a game like this, it, they realize, too, that there's a little difference in the strike zone between the two leagues, and sometimes they're a little lenient. And the times that all of a sudden it really hurts you, and these men are human just like the ball players. they're keyed up, and all of a sudden they revert back to what they have done all year long and what they maybe maybe will miss a pitch in your own eyes. And sometimes that can get you in a little bit of a jam. But they do a fine job, every one of them. That's why they're here in the World Series. And the first pitch of game number two is a strike, a fastball. Remember what he said in the pregame show, I know my job. Get the ball down and get the first pitch over. Fouled away, he's in front, 0-2. Oh the biggest thing about Jim Palmer, you saw that fastball there that is up and out of the strike zone, and that is the toughest pitch. I don't care if Palmer's pitching. Anybody that throws a high fastball, it's the toughest pitch in the world for a hitter to lay off. Most hitters are better high ball hitters. That one bounces. It's one ball and two strikes to Moreno. The Pittsburgh Pirates stole 188 bases this past season. This man picked off 77. One of these days, he'll be over 100 probably in a season. Down the line, foul ball. Also by Jim McKean of the American League umpiring staff. That 188 bases is in its own way a tribute, of course, Keith, to Chuck Tanner, who cast this ball club in a different mold, sacrificing power for speed. Made some trades. Al Oliver, a great ball player, went to Texas. The pitch is high. That time, Moreno laid off of it, and that's a very important phrase, laid off of it. That's it. Chuck Tanner, you know, has told him about that in the clubhouse. He saw Palmer many years as a manager of the Chicago White Sox. 2-2 pitch. Up the middle it goes. And into center field for a base hit, and Moreno is on. 
So this is what the Bucks have been looking for, getting that man with his 77 stolen bases on the season on base in a hurry. Palmer comes back with a fastball. He tries to get it down, but it's just up over the plate, a routine fastball, and Moreno takes him right back up the middle, just out of the reach of the crisscrossing Belanger and Smith. During the season, Moreno stole his 77. He was caught 21 times. Day, uh, Tim Foley is batting second in the order. Moreno stole second base 72 times, was caught 18 times. He stole third five times. He was caught three times. He probably will study Palmer before he goes. Maybe test him. The pitch to Foley is outside for ball one. Palmer has got to be aware of Moreno over there. He's got to realize he can't lollygag on that leg kick. He's got to get it loose and get it out of there. Pitch is high for ball two. Sometimes with a man that realizes that, whether it's Palmer or anybody else, it just throws you out of sync a little bit. Well, of course, Foley is the player we talked about last night so often. Had a spectacular, spectacular year. Has those subtle skills, especially gifted at advancing the runner, which is his job now. Goes Marino. The pitch is swung on and popped up on the right side in foul territory. And Marino is off of there. Missed the call from the third base coach. He didn't see it, and he went to sleep, and he's out of there on the... Well, that's startling to see him make that kind of mistake. Okay, now let's keep an eye on Marino because Belanger is right by him. He's going to be out anyway, Keith. He goes around the bag. He's not sure where it is. Now he sees. He touches the bag. He does not retrace his steps, no, and doesn't. Belanger's standing right there like the corner cop, and he's got him caught. And there he gave up on it. So the Bucks, who seemed rattled in the first inning yesterday, begin with a major mistake right here. And one of the few times, relatively speaking, that Foley did not advance the runner. But here's the big guy. Now that, that really startles me to see them start a ball game like that when they had it exactly the way they wanted it going. Here's Dave Parker hitting in the number three spot. Remember, Marino is a less effective runner on natural turf as, is, as exists here than on... The artificial turf at home. That's Sue Palmer, Jim Palmer's wife. The count on Dave Parker is one ball and one strike. That one bounces to the backstop. Now there you see Palmer is not going to give in to Parker. He's going to try and make Parker supply his own power. Dave, an excellent fastball hitter. And whether it's in, whether it's out, he can drive it anyway. As you heard Palmer say before, if he's going to go to the fastball many times as an out pitch now, not every pitch, he'll try and maybe jam. He's going to go away now. Down the left side, Desensei, long throw, Parker's quick, they get him. By a half a step. So Desensei comes up with a nifty play to end the inning. The Pittsburgh Pirates. See Omar Moreno run himself right out of any scoring possibility, and Desense ends it with this throw, and after a half inning of play, it is Pittsburgh nothing, and the Baltimore Orioles come into bat. Game two of the 79 World Series. There's your batting order for the Baltimore Orioles. There have been a couple of shifts in it. Uh, Lowenstein dropped down one. Desense moved up one. Otherwise, they pretty well hold their positions from last night. And they'll be facing Burt Blylevin, the big right-hander for the Pittsburgh Pirates. John Milner is in left field tonight for the Buccaneers. Moreno in center, Parker in right. Madlock, Foley, Garner, Stargell, Ott is back at the plate tonight. Blylevin, outstanding curveball. Born in Zeist, Holland, now lives in Villa Park, California. And he's just happy to be in the World Series with these Pittsburgh Pirates. He'll throw a straight change. Early in the season, oftentimes has trouble throwing it for strikes. Fastball might be considered relatively average. He can have good location if he is fine. His curveball is his out pitch. And it's a good one if it's there. 
Al Bunbury at the plate swings and fouls it away for strike one. And he starts him right off with that curveball. Keith, he, want to, he wants to establish something right here. And you said it. You hit the nail right on the head. If his curveball is right, he has got as good a curveball as anybody in the major leagues. I mean, it breaks and it snaps. Bunbury hits it high in the air. That will go down toward the corner and back into the crowd out of play. This was the time in last night's ball game when the Pirate defense fumbled the ball around. Huge error by Phil Garner. Tonight in the game, the Pirates committed an offensive error in the very first inning. Mandelara. Moreno on base at a big jump. He never did see the ball, and he then did not pick up third base coach Joe Lonette. And he was gone. The six errors last night, three by each team. You've got to go back 55 years for the last time that was done in a World Series game. That year, 24, the Senators had four errors, the Washington Senators then, and the then New York Giants had three. Hot with a silent appeal on the pitch. One ball and two strikes. Let's have a look at it. Alley tries to work the fastball inside. He's given him one fastball, two curves. Now his fastball will tail back very close. Bumbrey rolls it. Foul. Cal Ripken is the coach at third. Jim Fry, the coach at first base for these Baltimore Orioles. Bumbrey, of course, has had a long time career problem against Bert Bly Levin. When I asked him about it, he just laughed. He said, Did you talk to Bert yet? At that time, I hadn't. I said, No. He said, Well, see what you can find out and help me. <laughs> <laughs> Al flies down that line. He runs well. One and two pitch coming. Fouled away again. Belanger on deck and Singleton will be the third hitter. 93 mile an hour fastball. That's reaching for the high shelf, isn't it? Unlike Bumbrey, Belanger, despite the saw leg that Keith described as in there for a reason, he's got a career batting average against Bly Levin of 340. Changed on the ground. Garner, second baseman, throws him out. Now just watching the whole sequence of pitches there by Ott. He's like Dempsey. Nobody on base. They don't go to the sequence pitches. They're just using one a fastball to a curve and they're using the wiggle to change. And that's what he came with a change then. All right. There's Mark's leg. You see the protective device on it. Lyle Evan ready to pitch now with one out and nobody on. And he comes outside with his fastball. There's a shot right there. The viewers at home, they can sit and they know what pitch is coming before Belanger. There's another fastball away. In sail. Two balls and no strikes. There's the cocky little Bantam, Earl Weaver. He said, I thought you guys thought they were going to catch us last night. <laughs> Said we had some aces in the hole we never had to use. Now Blylevin working to Belanger has gone to three balls and no strikes. A 167 hitter on the season, but career-wise against Blylevin, potent at 340. <laughs> that yet. was another funny one. <laughs> Bert's thinking about it. There's a the strike. Bly Levin, I was talking to Belanger, and Bly Levin comes over and says, I thought you were going to be out today. He said, do me a favor, stay out. Ball is hit in the air to left field, hit well. Left fielder Milner goes back, makes the catch on the warning track. So he gets Belanger, but Mark hit it about 360 feet. Yes, indeed. If he pulled it a little, it would have been gone. Belanger that time, he just laying on a 3-1 fastball, and that's where he got it over the plate, but just didn't have enough power to hit it out right there. Kenny Singleton, switch hitting from the left side against the right-hander. 
see a lot of the Pirates out there with their hands in their pockets, the throwing hands. They've got those little pads that are with the chemicals in it to keep their fingers warm. And the trainer now comes out. He brings a tongue, what he call tongue depressor, out so he can clean his spikes. Now, I don't know why they use a tongue depressor either, except it's the one little thing that fits right in between the cleats. That's a pretty lady. That's Kenny Singleton's wife. Man can smile with a bride like that. Yes, sir. And a career like that. Pitch to Singleton is swung on and fouled upstairs. Interesting little thing about Ken. He grew up in Mount Vernon, New York, and his parents raised him in the house that an old teammate of yours used to live in and grew up in. Who's that? Big Ralph, number 13, Branca. <laughs> Change up misses. It's one and one. Fouled away. Fly 11, 12 and 5, 361 earned run average on the year, making his first start in a World Series game. Singleton hits it on the ground. Fly 11 can't get it. Garner does. Flips the first. Inning is over. And so. The Pittsburgh defense is peerless in the first inning after one, no score. The batting order here in the top of the second, Willie Stargell leads it off, followed by Milner and Madlock. Willie at 38, the leader of the ball club. Here's part of a conversation Howard had with him. Almost to a man, your club expresses its respect and affection for you and looks to you for leadership. This place a burden upon you in any way? No, I guess they do that to all senior citizens, and <laughs> I admire each and every one of our guys. Uh, they do ask questions about things from different times, but I think it's more of a friendship that we have, more so than looking upon me for certain leadership. I enjoy what whatever role I do specifically hold, and I'm just very pleased to be around so many fine individuals with extreme amount of talent. Well said. Last night, hit a shot out of here. Now he looks at a fastball pitcher, and he'll wind it up. And take it for strike one. There's your high fastball. Downtown. Missed it. Downtown, if he had it in a perfect location. That's the key. Tight. <laughs> you think he doesn't know how to pitch? He's a cagey <laughs> bird, isn't Master he? surgeon out there. You just saw it with that pitch. The count is 2 2 on Willie. Shot to right, base hit. Patience. Great a asset for a hitter. His problem was that he was up against a surgeon with the bat. That's right. He just didn't get it up enough. He didn't get it in the same position where he got that other one. He got it out over the plate just a little bit. That's what makes guys good hitters, though. You don't keep getting them out the same way. If they do, they'd be hitting 210 instead of 310. Well, this fellow's a dangerous hitter. Melner, the former Met, 16 home runs. John Platoon this year for a career high average of 276. Lifetime, he's 248. Up the middle, base hit. Stargell will turn it second and hold. Back-to-back -back singles by Pittsburgh at the top of the second inning. Now they've all been on the fastball. Stargell got the fastball, singled to the hole on the right side. Milner got the fastball, hit it right back up the middle. 
It's interesting for me to watch Dempsey behind the plate because unlike Flanagan last night, Dempsey moves a little bit more for Palmer. I think Rick has maybe a much better idea of the control of Palmer and realizes that maybe he's not going to miss quite as much as some of the other members of the Orioles staff. Just checking with the sensei a moment ago on the options. And Bill Madlock stands in, hits it to the right side, foul upstairs. Ed Ott has moved to the on-deck circle. Here in the early innings, uh, you're not going to have a two-time National League batting champion, I don't believe. You're not going to have him sacrifice here. Nope. Chuck Tanner's going to say, I want some runs on the board, boys. Let's us get a hit early. Stargell off second base. The pitch is high to Madlock. Stargell at second and Milner at first. Palmer went over to talk to DeSensei about how he was going to try to pitch to Madlock. Got to set it up. Stargell, not good speed, particularly at second base. High fastball, two balls and a strike. Right now, Jim is struggling. So far, it's much like a game he pitched in the early season, as you look at his wife again, against the Yankees. He gave up a couple of runs to the Yankees early. They let him off the hook, and they were dead. That ball is hit to right center field. It's going to be in there for a base hit. Singleton gets over there and cuts it off. Stargell pumps around third. He comes to score. Pittsburgh breaks on top tonight. A score of one nothing as Milner moves from first to third. That's three successive singles. And all sharply hit balls. The point I was making is if you're going to get this guy, you want to get him early and you want to get him big. Now that's exactly right, Howard, because if you give Jim Palmer a few innings to work on, and here he gets a fastball just up over the plate. That's all it was. And you've got a guy, as I said before, two-time National League batting champion, Bill Madlock, standing in there. You can't get away with those pitches. He is too good of a hitter. And he's a bat manipulator. He hit that ball to right center. Sammy Stewart gets up to throw in the Baltimore bullpen as Ed Ott, the catcher, stands in. Ott, 273 on the year. They go over to first base, and it was pretty close. Here's the right-hander, Sammy Stewart. Another young arm. Here's the play at first base. You can see how close it was. Now we'll watch the stretch motion of Palmer. He will not set at the belt because he takes his takeaway is too deliberate it's too high he sets high and he pitches from that position he'll be right around there you see right around the chin swing and a miss by out on a high fastball and that ball is just up around the chin you could realize what a jump a runner could get on him from first base if he sat at the belt like well say the majority of the pitchers but he's right up around the chin this time he's way up one ball and one strike. With Milner at third, Stargell has scored on Madlock single. Four hits total now for these Pittsburgh Pirates. Baltimore jumped out 5 nothing last night in the bottom of the first inning. Here in the second, as a high fly ball hit deep to left center field, Bumbry goes back to the edge of the grass, makes the catch, tag at third. Milner scores, sacrifice fly for Rockner, run batted in. 2 nothing Pittsburgh. That's the first the out game. in the inning. That block is at first base. Here's Phil Garner. The Pirate second baseman, loose and easy today after a tough night last night. Holding Madlock at first, one out, two runs across. Four sharply hit balls in this inning. Off Palmer. Madlock's going. Dempsey's throw. They've got him. One and on. What a release. Oh. What a release by Dempsey. And he had it right on the money. Madlock had a pretty good jump. But I'll guarantee you, Dempsey came out of there throwing. And they got him with ease. Well, 
We gave Dempsey a huge edge in that man-for-man -man comparison yesterday. And on a swinging strike, you saw one of the reasons why. He nailed 48% of the would-be Steelers against him compared to the league average of 36% in the year 1979. Change up curve, drips inside. It's two balls and one strike now to Phil Garner with two out and two runs across. <laughs> two and two. You'll notice, too, Palmer likes to work in a hurry. You watch how fast Dempsey gives him a sign. Get on the ground, Belanger. Inning is over, but it's a productive one for the Pittsburgh Pirates. After one and a half innings of play, the Bucks take the lead, two to nothing. We'll go to the bottom of the second inning now with Eddie Murray, Doug DeSensei, and John Lowenstein against Bert Blylevin, Rick Albert Blylevin. Just watching and watching Blylevin throw there, you remember watching that curveball, and he has, like we said, one of the best in baseball. There were some years back when they were talking about the curveball being an optical illusion. <laughs> I wish whoever said that had to stand up there and hit against it. <laughs> that was introduced, that theory, first in Bert L. Standish's Frank Merriwell books. <laughs> <laughs> but there were a lot of physicists who tried to go through the motions or did go through the motions of either trying to prove or disprove it. The pitch to Eddie Murray. Strike call. It's 2-0 Pittsburgh. Two runs on three hits in the top of the second inning. One ball and one strike. Moreno toward right center for Murray. Murray hits it high, hits it deep, way back. If it's there, it's gone, it's gone. He got it right in Eddie's grove, John. He got a change. He did not take enough off of it. He got it up over the plate. And, of course, Murray hit it well. It's only 309 down the line, but that was a lot further than 309. Yeah, went in with a second bet. That's the man who had 25 homers on the air and 99 ribbies. Look at it again. Watch the location. Up, and you don't get it in that power zone. He hit it a ton. Goes right into the corner of the second deck, looked like. Dropping down, down, and plunk. And it's a two-to-one ball game with Doug DeSensei at the plate. DeSensei hit a two-run homer last night. Slider snaps in for strike. DeSensei a little bit bewildered right there. He said, well, what kind of a strike is that? Well, Doug, that's a National League strike. <laughs> 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 That's fouled away upstairs. That's Doogie's wife, Mrs. DeSensei. We don't have quite as many parkas in evidence tonight in the stocking hats that we saw last night, but Jerry Klein's wearing a terrible looking thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sharp shot, third base, bad luck, throws him out, one away. For the edification of all viewers, Keith Jackson is now wearing a coat. <laughs> He's not willing to take on clinical pneumonia. <laughs> You're right. John Lowenstein up now. Not having trouble shaking off that sore ankle. It just bothers him. Yeah. <laughs> Second night in a row. They can retire it now. The pitch is fouled away. I would hope. This telecast presented by authority of Major League Baseball, intended solely for the private non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of the game 
pitches outside, without the express written consent of Major League Baseball is prohibited. Count is one and one. To Lowenstein with one run across on Eddie Murray's home run. Two to one ball game. Lyle Evans' dad delivers molasses to cattlemen in Southern California. Now, I suspect that Howard would not know what that was for. Don might. <laughs> That's for sweetening the food. Makes them nice and fat. They eat it. Howard will take the end product. <laughs> <laughs> this is high and away. Two and two. Nobody likes a wise guy, Keith. <laughs> Medium rare, he says. <laughs> Fly Levin comes at 2 2. Lowenstein looks outside. Counts full. Outfield playing John straight away. Milner down and left. Not anticipating that John would pull Bly Levin up the alley. John didn't pull on the angels as he gets ball four outside. He hit it right down in the corner. Big blow in the American League Championship Series. That's the first free pass of the night issued by Bly Levin. And now here is switch hitter Billy Smith, the second baseman. You got to think that Ed Ott is going out there to tell Bly Levin as he went to that 3 2 curveball right there. He said, Come on now, don't start rushing it. Stay there, stay within yourself. Don't get out in front of that arm. Billy Fields, he's a better hitter left handed. And you get the feeling watching these two teams go at each other that last night was, as we stated, an augury of the kind of series it's going to be. Low. Battle, battle, battle. Fight back. One out, one on, one in. Bottom of the second. Stargell holding against Lowenstein. On the corner. <laughs> mm. Uh oh. I don't know if that's an omen or not, but keeping the mice away from the bullpen. The one-one pitch to Smith. Up back foul out of play. That's 26 pitches now for Bly Levin in the ball game. Throw it hard over 90 miles an hour. Interesting, isn't it? Well, Bert's in a different league now. Lowenstein breaks and goes. Smith fouls it away out of play. Let to see John was kept fudging up the line, inching up the line, and kept giving up the distance to him. It's walking back deliberately. He does have a very sore ankle. He's got a sore ankle, very true, but you got to keep an eye on Lowenstein because outside of Bumbry, he was number two on that ball club and stolen bases was 16 this year. Burton may have a better look at him this time. Does not go. The pitch is rifle shot. Garner has it back to first. No. That's two out. Smith hit it on the button. He really did. Now watch the location of the breaking pitch. Really not in that good of a location. Burt's been trying to bring that breaking pitch a few times tonight to the left-handers, especially from the outside in. There's Rick Dempsey. Who went hitless last night and Keith talked about Moreno's failures last night in a talk with Rick before the game he was saying can't believe what happened to me I left four men on base in particular that was a call ball he was upset about his own performance against Enrique Enrique Romo he said the man got me with three fastballs high and tight right where I can kill the ball but I kept looking for that Scrooge. That fastball hit the outside corner. Make it one and one. 
Eddie Murray, the man who hits the home run. Don't smile, Eddie. You're still behind. Up high with that fastball. Two and one. On deck, the pitcher, Jim Palmer. Time called as Hot goes to the mound again. Oklahoma, Texas. Why, they're starting together already in Big D, getting ready for that one. The Sooners ranked third in the nation. Texas ranked four. And Texas State Fair is going on with about 300,000 folks whirling around and right in the middle of it Saturday afternoon. That old traditional football game. The ball is bounced over the pitcher's head towards center field. Knocked down by the shortstop goalie. No play. Runs it into center field. And the base runner goes storming into third. Lowenstein took a look. John saw the ball knocked down and rolling, and he took off. Foley made a good play to get to the ball. The ball had the top spin on it. And see it kick away from him. Now he bobbles it. Now he tries to turn around and as he kicks at Lowenstein. He just says, well, I'll just keep on going right to third. Chuck Tanner joins the conference out on the mound as you see it again. Bert had obviously no chance. Watch this again because Foley was unlucky on it. There was the good effort and now his foot kicked the ball away from him. And that's what enabled the runner to get the extra base. Lowenstein to go to third. No error on the play, just simply a single. And here... Again, the absence of the designated hitter rule in this World Series militating against the birds. Jim Palmer, who did not go to the plate in 79, <laughs> does have a hitting history, however. He did have a little smile on his face, though. Did you see that? His best year, he had 224 in 1972. Lifetime career average, 174, and he takes a whiff and misses. Well, I think Jim Palmer was looking for the same thing that I was looking for, the breaking pitch. Threw the fastball by him. You've got two out, runners at the corner. In a two-to-one ball game. In the bottom of the second inning. Now you'll get it. Uh-oh. Uncle Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> I think Sue sees the humor of the situation. The fact that Jim Palmer has to hit for himself. Hasn't been to the plate all year long. Little tap foul. Jim's a good athlete, good tennis player, good golfer. He's a good basketball player. That's right. He's still collecting art. Yep. Art. Got a two-strike count on him right now for the Dutchman Bly Levin. Two out, two on. Struck him out. So, Baltimore has a flurry in the bottom of the second. They do get one run on Murray's home run. And after two, it's two to one Pittsburgh. Jim Palmer warming up for the top of the third inning. With Burt Blylevin scheduled to come out as the leadoff hitter. Then Moreno and Foley to follow. Seems to me, Don, you as the former pitching great, two things. Palmer must settle down now. They well, get to him, he'll be gone. Well, and the other one is Lylevin is struggling and not too successfully to control his curveball. Now, Jim Palmer, uh, you said before, Howard, if you're going to get Palmer, you've got to get him early because all of a sudden he just falls, starts falling into his good pitching pattern and he just becomes double tough. Bly Levin so far has good velocity. He's throwing the ball well. He has shown you exceptional curveballs. But he hasn't been very consistent with him. If he gets that curveball over consistently, he's going to be tough too. Fouls the first pitch away. Burt grew up about 10 minutes from Anaheim Stadium where the Angels play. And he's hiding the ballpark. Sneak in. Go out in the dark and make believe he was pitching for the Angels. And to this day, if you asked him, he'd say, that's the club I ultimately someday want to pitch for. Villa Park, right down the road from the... Oh, hit that on the nose. Bumbry on his horse. Runs it down. Al had him played just right. He had him over in right center. 
good thing. It took the speed of Bumbry to run it down, too. Palmer got the fastball up over the plate. And yeah, really, every ball hit against Jim has been sharply hit. Well, now, one of the more entertaining conversations of this World Series probably took place between third base coach Joe Lynette and Omar <laughs> Marino. After the top half of the first inning, Omar is up now. Knowing Lynette, he did not mince words. Nope. He got him told, I'll guarantee you that. He says, I'm standing over here for one reason. Slides up the handle, pulls it away, and takes a strike. And he had the sensei moving. Doug playing him pretty close as it is. Now he's going to come in about another yard. That's got to be an advantage, though, for Marino, Keith, because yeah. every time you bring that third baseman in a foot or so, well, you can just have that more, much more of a chance to slap it by him. Baseball is a game of geometry in many instances. Strike two. You saw a great throw by Rick Dempsey to get a would-be base dealer just a few moments ago. Rick has great confidence that he'll be able to control Marino here at Memorial Stadium on the natural turf. If Marino gets on and seeks to go. Struck him out. Pitched him well that time. Oh, he did a fastball, slow curve, and an excellent change that tailed away from him, and we'll see you later. And he kept it down. That's how That's the story has been the done in the ball game. Foley fouled out. First time up. Fouls that one away out of play. Again, to restate the circumstances, you have a National League umpire back at the plate tonight, Bob Engel. That's why we've talked so much about the strike zone. That's hit down the right side. It's a fair ball. Nice play by Singleton. And he holds him to a single. Well, that play was a nice play, and it all evolved from position play. Singleton, well, obviously, they've had excellent scouting reports, and that's where your scouting reports come in, Don, on the kind of hitter Foley is, and so frequently he goes down that right field foul line. Well, he's got the bat up, like we said, about three or four inches. Palmer again gets a fastball up and over the plate. Foley just lays the bat on the ball, and you had it pointed out perfectly, Howard. He is playing him in perfect position and shading him towards the line and right. Now, here is Dave Parker, and in the 1979 World Series, robust batting average. They got him on a bounce of the third his first time excellent play incidentally by the sensei who showed no mental hangover from his mishaps of yesterday now you see that left side of the infield they play Parker they shift on him they're back into the left to their left that's foul to the left side out of play what you must remember is Parker, as you look at the infield, you see how they are, in effect, shifted over. But Parker showed great ability in the late weeks of the season to go to the left side. Lordy, he's so strong. 6'5", 231. Fouled again off the end of the bat. He's not getting around on point. Both not times he just nipped it off the end of the bat. Well, you heard... Jim say in the pregame show that he knows how to get Palmer out if he can get his fastball high and tight. Uh, Parker out. I think I said Palmer. That bounces. It's knocked down by Dempsey. Foley runs and he's in. Well, Rick had trouble getting around uh, the man-sized Dave Parker to get a hold of the ball. Well, here's a great play. Now, this play shouldn't even be close. Watch how close Rick Dempsey makes it. Hits his mask. Mm. Almost knocks Good. it off. Now comes out in front of the plate. Palmer very alertly showing. Look at this play. Now this play is fairly close at second base. Notice too the force he put into the effort. After he threw the ball, he went right down on his face. But he was on target. He's a bulldog back there. He's a good one. That's a wild pitch. It do make a difference. Sir. That comes apart, goes over to the sensei at third, and he throws him out. 
So he sawed off the bat. Sawed him right off at the handle. And it's two to one after two and a half. Burt Blyleving will go through the Baltimore order for the second time now. Earlier, Howard talked to him about a very important thing in his whole baseball life. Bert, I must talk to you candidly. You're a sensitive, intelligent fella. You know in the American League they put the rap on you that you did not win the big ones. Is that true? Well, you know, it depends on what they say the big one is. Uh, if I lose a game 2-1, to one and, you know, and I pitch nine innings and I still lose 2-1 to one by... By hanging a curveball in the eighth or ninth inning, I guess you know. I guess I can't win a big one, but uh, I guess we'll just have to find out tonight if I can win the big one or not. You find yourself thinking about that kind of stuff? No, I really don't let that bother me because this is my tenth year. Uh, I know what I have to do. I have a lot of personal goals in baseball. I, I've I've achieved a lot so far. The good Lord gave me a good health. Uh, that's basically what I look for: is just to be consistent for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And tonight, when I go out there, I'll just. Try to be consistent. Try to keep our club in the ball game, like our our bullpen did last night, and give our ch our club a chance to come back and rally. But didn't you beat that rap forevermore by your pitching down the stretch and by your victory over the Reds in the playoffs? Well, I hope so. But you know, like I say, the news media they can write what they want. Uh, they have to sell papers. So basically, I just have to go out there and be consistent for the Pittsburgh Pirates or whatever club I'm with. They can write what they want. On the outside corner. Strike one to Al Bumbry, Mark Belanger, and Ken Singleton. Bert Blylevin originally signed by the Twins in 1969. He pitched 21 games in the minors and then went to the majors. And Bumbry hits a high fly ball to the left side. The left fielder, Milner, coming in, flags it down in fair territory. And Bumbry is out. When uh, Burt went up to the Minnesota Twins in 1970, he joined a pretty decent pitching staff, too, with people like Jim Perry, Jim Cotton, Louis Teant, and Dave Boswell. It was a pretty strong staff in those days. Checking the ball place. a lot. Yep. Well, they just, I don't know whether Blylevin threw that out or Belanger came on and said he wanted to see it. The ball hadn't touched the ground yet. Belanger, fly ball, well hit the left field first time up. Ball has 108 stitches in it. Maybe they thought it had less. That particular <laughs> ball. Pops it up on the right side. Garner backs up. Parker. <laughs> oh, no, drops the ball. And Belanger goes into second base. This is something that you see every manager at home, I'll guarantee you right now, saying, see, I told you, I knew it would happen sometime. Everything nowadays is relative, but you've got now the new one-handed catch. Managers try and get guys away from that if they can. They say, if you ever drop one, but now it's you and me. But you saw Watch Barker as Garner suddenly gets out of the way. His concentration was divided. He was aware of Garner's earlier presence, and he was half looking for Garner as he went for the ball. So the Bucks have made two mistakes tonight, even though they lead two to one. Moreno's mistake on the bases, and that. And Singleton at the plate with power. 35 home runs, 111 runs batted in on the regular season, fouls the first pitch away. You got to be careful getting that fastball up to this guy out over the plate because he'll just take you right out into the Baltimore bullpen. One out and Belanger at second base on the error. Right field by Parker. Hit to the right side. Flagged down by Garner. And he throws Singleton out. Nice play by the Pittsburgh second baseman. Which brings up the man who accounted for the lone bird run thus far, Eddie Murray, as you look at that again. That ball had top spin. Look at the last minute 
It's grabbed by Garner. That ball was really moving on. Now with Belanger moving over to third, here's Murray. One more look at it. Eddie's home run back in the second to make it a two to one ball game. I just got to believe right here that they have just talked about look at don't let this guy beat you. Don't let him put him ahead. You got first base open even though you're putting another man on. You've got two outs. You've got the right hander coming up behind him and Doug DeSensei. He jerks one here. Ed could get a lot of votes by morning. They do go outside and high with that one. No, I think Don is absolutely right. I was in a similar situation last night. Pitch carefully. If he wants to go for a bad one, let him. Otherwise, put him on. Blylevin has thrown 50 pitches in the ball game. Baltimore's batting in the bottom of the third inning. Ed Ott having a few words as you look at Belanger at third with home plate umpire Bob Engel, then just standing up and saying, well, wait a minute, where am I positioning myself? I thought that last pitch might have been a strike. Fastball is high and away, and it's three balls and no strikes. And don't be surprised if he's green-lighted right here. That, too, happened last night. Chuck Tanner. Do it. Where he walks. Here's the sensei. Series goes on to Pittsburgh. And they're ambivalent about the weather when you folks get over there. Well, I want to make a note of the fact that we're going to miss you, old buddy. You'll be down doing Texas against Oklahoma. Al Michaels will be joining us. Don't rain it out now, because I have to hurry on the South Bend the next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here is Doug DeSensei now with two out. And stay away from that state fair. <laughs> Runners at the corner. And the breaking pitch misses for ball one. Fly Levin's got to have the curve working. Tanner starting to walk around in the dugout. He's just taking another peek at that batting order is what he's doing there. Who's next? Lowenstein's next. Dexim wasn't really that close though. There's an appeal being made, but that bat did not leave the shoulder. Look at it again. Duck started to go, and then he realized that he better just move on out of the way. Here, running fastball. That was not a swing. No, nope. did not go around. Pretty good career against Bly Levin. Yes, he has a fondness for him. He went to three and one with Belanger, my brother, the sensei, and then. Uh, Doug gets this one though on the ground. Big gravy bounce to the shortstop Foley, and he guns it across. And Bert Bly Levin and the Pittsburgh Pirates dodge a bullet. And Dave Parker's carelessness in right field. Score remains 2 1 after 3. Jim Palmer will pitch now to Willie Stargell, John Miller, Milner, and Bill Madlock. Palmer celebrating his 34th birthday next Monday. These are the three hitters who hit consecutive singles in the second inning that led to the two bucko runs. Let's see if Palmer is beginning to settle down. Outfield swings around to the right and goes just about as far back as they can for Willie. And Palmer's pitch is high and away for ball one. You mentioned Palmer having the bad back. There you see the off defensive alignment for the Baltimore Orioles. That's popped up foul. It's going to drift back out of play. Billy Smith, the second baseman, is right between first and second on the edge of the grass. And he has really swung around. But you can understand how a bad back could really hurt Jim Palmer. Palmer is more of a straight up and down type pitcher. And when he can't bend that back, that gets him in a lot of trouble.
One one pitch to Willie. Hard shot. Hook into the corner. Going foul. Got most of it. Thing never did get more than 15 feet off the ground, but it went all the way to the wall. Palmer was saying something to Stargell, like, how in the world did you ever hit this ball? Well, look, you, we've talked <laughs> about Stargell. See, we low talked about there. Stargell on the low ball last night, and I threw in Reggie, too. He can kill you on the low ball. He golfs it and for tremendous distances. One and two to Willie. Fouls it away. When you're, barely. Keith, when you're playing this Pittsburgh team, your task is always to contain them, to stay within a run or two of them at the very most, because once they start throwing the Tacolbys of the world at you, you're dead. That ball is hit out into short left field. Lowenstein comes hard. Good play, John. He was fooled on that ball, but he recovered great. And that will fool a lot of outfielders as you look at it again. Palmer gets a fastball up, and Stargell with that big swing didn't get it all, but Lowenstein broke the wrong way. Now he has to try and come correct himself, come back in, and then makes a fine play on the ball. Saw so leg and all. This is a competitor. He okay. always seems to make the plays that matter most, get the hits that matter most. John Milner at the plate. First pitch is low inside for ball one. I think interesting, too, to note the concentration written all over John Lowenstein as he came in pursuing that dying fly. Low. You see how Palmer's gone to school on these first two guys. He just didn't give Stargell that good fastball like he did the first time. He hasn't given... Milner the same. Jim has now thrown 50 pitches. We're in the top of the fourth with one out. Mm. High pop to the infield. Eddie Murray comes down the line. When Milner first came up with the Mets, they had dreams that he would be a left-handed Hank Aaron. Well, when John came up, everybody was looking for another Hank Aaron. And I tell you, he never materialized for the Mets, and he's never become the great hitter they anticipated he would be. But he's become a dangerous offensive player this year. Here's a guy with the great swing. Her ball misses to Matlock. Notice the change in pitching style now for Palmer. Oh, yeah. He's gone to the off-speed stuff. High bouncer, Desensei. Throws it out. So Jim Palmer gets Pittsburgh in order in the top of the fourth after three and a half. It's two to one Buccaneers. Last night, Mark Belanger had Dave Parker come crashing into him at second base. Howard, talk to Mark about it. First, Mark, exactly what happened on that play with Parker in the ninth. Well, uh, I lost my footing around the bag, and uh, which brought me backwards. And uh, I think my left foot went in front of the bag. And uh, the throw was there on time. It was a perfect throw. And when I did apply the tag, uh, you know, he came in uh, pretty hard, which is, you know, that's going to be his job to try to knock the, knock the ball out, jar the ball out. And uh, he in turn, uh, you know, spiked my leg and my hand. And the ball did pop out, and I grabbed it right away. But the umpire was right on the play, and uh, he said I bobbled it, and, you know, that's the way it was. What's the nature of the damage to the leg? Well, it's pretty sore. It's uh, very sore right now. I used ice pack and uh, kept it elevated last night. The hand is basically superficial wounds, but uh, uh, it's very sore. And I'm going to have to try it and see if I can. Uh, uh, we'll be able to move good. All right, pregame comments from Mark Belanger about having a tree fall on him last night at second base. <laughs> <laughs> now we go to the bottom of the fourth inning for John Lowenstein, Billy Smith, and Rick Dempsey. So often a man makes a big defensive play and then comes up first to lead. And here it is. Lowenstein made the fine catch in left field. You know, I think maybe some of our <laughs> viewers that are watching that saw the different uniform used by Baltimore last night. They have two sets. Last night they used the orange top as that's fouled away. And tonight, of course, they've gone to the all white. So don't let that fool you. That is still the same Baltimore Oriole ball club. Pittsburgh has multiple uniforms as well. well they got a bunch. <laughs> that ball is hit sharply. Garner flags at it and can't come up with it. Ah, 
I don't know whether this is a football hop or not, but they give him an error. It's a tough error. No, wait a minute. Not yet they haven't. No, given they him haven't. Him. That error is on Hawkins. That ball, that ball came up on him just a little bit. They give him a base hit. Yeah. Better. Which I think is a proper call. Three sports writers serving as official scorers in this series. And that's the subject we'll drop for the moment. So Garner shaking his head. He says, I've got that on the carpet at home. That ball is fouled by Billy Smith sharply down the right side. Lyle Levin going into the bottom of the fourth had already thrown more pitches than Palmer has thrown in the four innings he's worked against the Bucks. And Burt, who had only, what was it, four complete games out of 37 starts, he has to be concerned about Tyron. Billy Smith, with one strike on him, rolls it on the ground to Matlock. He'll go to second one, back to first, double play. Well, that'll help the pitcher. That was a great turnover by Garner at second base. He was taking no chances whatsoever with Lowenstein trying to break up that double play. Little check swing. Taking the third baseman right in front of him. Taking him right to the bag. Now watch Garner. Get him down. Get down. Oh, Johnny. Boy, he really <laughs> whipped it through there, didn't he? <laughs> That's what you got to do. You come, up with a, you come up with a couple of stumps if you don't. <laughs> That's right. Crappy <laughs> little guy, Garner. He doesn't let an error upset him. Rick Dempsey swings and fouls it back. Look at this angle now. You see him put that runner down. Wow. You take one of those in the chop, you, you wear it home. That's it. You wear it all winter. <laughs> the man he threw to discussed Garner's... Era, key era last night, Stodgill on the bus coming to the ballpark today. He told him to forget it. He said, remember in the next to the last game of the season when we were still battling for the pennant? I threw a down and out to what should have been <laughs> Lynn Swan. <laughs> and nobody could get to the ball, and I lost the game for us. So don't worry about it. I had, to, I had to laugh because he says, you know, he says, I thought they would call timeout. It was incomplete, but they didn't in the run score. <laughs> two balls and a strike to Dempsey with two out. And the base is clean, and Bob Engel waves the right arm to make it 2-2. Two -two. Well, on to Pittsburgh tomorrow, and what a great sports city that is. It's become a city of champions with the mighty Steelers and now the Bucks. Reaches and bounces it to the shortstop, Foley. Throws him out. So the double play helps. And we've played four innings of play at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, and Pittsburgh leads it 2-1. to one. We go to the top of the fifth inning for Ed Ott. Here's Big Don Drysdale. All right, Keith, it'll be Ott, Garner, and Bly Levin. And that first pitch is fouled back. Ott has sacrificed Fly his first time at bat. Right now, he has driven in, has proven to be the go-ahead run. It is two to 2-1 Pittsburgh. We're in the top of the fifth. Change a drag attempt, and Palmer has it on a hop and throws him out. Well, one up, one down for the Pirates, and Howard, he is starting to gel. Well, in the pregame interview, he said his task, and he talked about the playoff game against the Angels, to keep his ball club in the game, and they'll find a way to win it, which has been the Baltimore pattern this year. Now he seems to be keeping his club in the game. But there's a way to go yet. Oh, there is. And Phil Garner will step in. He bounced to Belanger at short his first time at bat. You saw Palmer before looking to the outfield hands parallel right in front of his chest. He'll play Garner straight away, and he hits it straight away. A little scriver right back up the middle. There is not a weak spot in this Pittsburgh lineup. You can't ever get a momentary letter. Unless it be the pitcher, of course. Garner says... Yeah, he feels he got away with one on that hit. He did. He, Palmer knows it too. He's kind of nodding his head and acknowledging the fact that, yeah, you got me there. Now here's Blylevin, and now the Baltimore Orioles with one out of the man on. They will look for the sacrifice. Desensei up on the grass at third with Murray holding Garner at first. 
One out. There's the sensei. Good bunt by Blyle. Having a little hard. Murray, a good throw to get him. And the return throw in down. Beautiful, beautiful defensive play. As good as you can say. And it all rested on Eddie Murray, who had the guts to take the chance and make that hard, perfect throw to second. And then an equally good reeling. Look at it again. Murray had to decide instantly. He's got to know how hard that ball is bunted. Belanger, the great turnover, the return throw to Billy Smith, and they double up the pitcher, Blylevin. And the Pirates are gone, and after four and a half, it's two to one Pittsburgh. Now, Jim Palmer to lead it off, and we talked about a class guy he is. He had a chance to talk with.